heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, the banking chaos continues. SBB Financial it files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy as First Republic sees its worst week ever on record. We'll bring you the updates as they cross. And we'll look at how this is playing out in the market. Sylvia Jablonski of Defiance ETFs joins us with her take on Bitcoin, which is flirting with its biggest weekly gain in almost two years. Plus how the crisis is playing out in the C-suite. We speak with the CEOs of Mercury, of Rippling for their take, and we get the venture capital outlook with the co-founder of Cozla Ventures. All that, so much more coming up. Let's get first to an extraordinary week on the markets that finishes with an extraordinary day. We're off by 1% on the Nasdaq, but remember, this index is actually higher to the tune of 4% on the week as actually the big tech still outperforms. We're more worried about small tech and, of course, the banks, the KBW Bank Index. Another sink by 15% on the week. We're down by 5% on the day. We are down by the most on the month since March of 2020. 28% of value of the KBW Bank Index has been extinguished. Two-year yields, we fly to safety once again. We're off by 24 basis points. This is we see inflation expectations from the consumer from the UMISH data coming down. Let's move it on. Let's look at what's happening. What was once an inflation hedge at the moment. Is it some sort of, well, safety trade at the moment as well? Up 23% in the last five days for Bitcoin. Ed. Yeah. Extraordinary. Dig into some of the micro moves. Well, look, the mentality of the market's really interesting. You look at a name like Microsoft, up half a percentage point when most names on the NASDAQ 100 are down. There's a debate whether that's a move to safety or if it's a feel-good from all their AI announcements this week. NVIDIA pushing higher 1%. Morgan Stanley calling this a mega trend in AI. And NVIDIA, of course, has been talked about for a few days now as one of the main beneficiaries. Interesting to look at the streamers. Disney down 9 tenths of 1%. Netflix down pretty significantly. Third-party data out Friday showed that actually Disney's ad-supported tier of Disney Plus is outperforming the ad-supported tiers of some of its peers, not translating through to the stock. First Republic, we've had halts, we've had volatility. All told, this stock is down 70% over a five-day basis. It's worst week on record. The stock trading at its lowest level since 2011. We are still waiting for definitive answers in this banking sector. Yeah. What we know is that Biden's paying very close attention to this, Karen. <laughs> as we all are. And let's just talk a little bit about the step-by-step -step take with SVB, the parent company filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy earlier today. With us now to break it all down, as she has done every single day of the week and the weekend before, Bloomberg's Shanali Basak. And Shanali, what does it mean for the parent company to file for bankruptcy and who's involved? There are a lot of questions to be considered here. I've been following this closely. I've been asking all week, why has there not been a bankruptcy filing? Now what you'll have is creditors who will want a certain amount of money back, number one. Number two, there are certain assets that will not be included here, certain banking assets, and including some of the assets tied to his venture portfolio here and its securities business as well. What I've been hearing throughout the entire week was the difficulty, guys, it has been to sell assets, to recoup value here. Now this is under the, uh, the uh, overseeing of a bankruptcy judge as well. The hope here is that there is enough money that can be redeemed here by right. strategic options mm. for some of these assets. I mean, Ed, what's interesting, of course, Silicon Valley Bank, which is previously underneath SVB Financial, well, it's right. still got a bridge bank, right? I mean, it's got new executives. Yes, we've got to be really clear. It's SVB Financial that did the Chapter 13. The SVB, company. the Brinch Bank, right? It continues to be a California chartered bank under the receivership of the FDIC, so it cannot fall into bankruptcy. That said, Shanali, astonishing reporting on the Bloomberg Terminal yes. that one year ago, the San Francisco Fed brought in a new assessment team, quickly flagged issues at that bank, and asked management to act on it. What have we reported? This is a very complicated thing, and there's a lot of questions being asked, not just about how they lobbied for easiness when it came to how they operated. There's a lot of questions here about whether the system across the United States is not equal to begin with. Uh, one example that you pointed out, frankly, Ed, is that, that the rollback and rules really helped catapult the uh, expansion here of Silicon Valley Bank in the most recent years. I would also say that when it comes to the 
the way they lent to businesses. They had different rules than some of the largest banks that are OCC chartered, that is the Office of the Comptroller of Currency the Charter. They had really strict rules around leverage lending and lending to unprofitable venture-backed companies, which is why now when you're seeing these firms trying to buy and circle assets around that venture-backed loan portfolio, even private equity and private capital firms are saying this is a no-go because it's not how they were used to lending. So it's a complicated equation. It doesn't mean things won't get sold. People are definitely looking at the pieces of the pie and the assets here. But to your point here, regulation, right. the lack thereof, the process and kind of pushing for lighter regulations, that won't just be looked at for this firm, guys. It will be looked at for a lot of the smaller firms that have done the exact same thing. Well, we talk about it's seven days since Silicon Valley Bank failed, Caroline. And I think the question we're going to ask throughout this program is about accountability. In mm. other words, who was responsible for what happened? And we actually do not have a clear answer on that yet. And it's something, Shanali, that Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, is looking into accountability. And we still have yet ships to fall with other regional lenders. We certainly do. I think we have to look at that uh, drop off in the stock price as well as the easing of the bonds as well. When you look at First Republic, just how much in value this company has lost this week alone. It's now less than a $5 billion company by market value. Uh, we look at what has to be at SVB. We've been talking about this. My sources were saying this is a, a bank you could have maybe bought on Thursday night before that $40 billion, $42 billion deposit deposit flight, but things deteriorated quickly. They're trying not to make this happen for First Republic. First Republic still has a lot of amazing assets. By the way, for the California community, you talk to banks across the country, First Republic really dove in in a way that a lot of big banks uh, were not on top of as quickly as they were when it came to catering to the elite of uh, California, certainly the country. Big wealth manager, uh, big mortgage lender, for example. And so a lot of questions about the future of First Republic as well, both for the California community as well as the rest of the country, and whether this is a bank that can be sold ultimately and that is something yeah. the market is watching for very closely Bloomberg Snarly Bassett you have been everywhere this week thank you for your reporting happy Friday I want to stick with the markets and the market impact of what's playing out across asset and bring in Sylvia Jablonski Defiance ETF's CEO and CIO and, and Sylvia Caroline made a really good point at the top of the show you look at the Nasdaq 100 for example headed for its best weeks since November despite sort of the broad risk-off sentiment that we've seen throughout this week driven by headlines. Hi, Ed. Great to be here. And yes, it, it was a great point made at the top of the show. And actually, it's something that um, I've been talking about and thinking about for weeks. So, uh, And prior to the banking crisis here, so in my mind, even if you take away the banking crisis, some of the top FANG companies out there, the top tech names especially, are on the you know, precipice of innovation with ChatGPT. We all sort of know AI and how we expect that to play out. So there's a good reason to invest for, for that reason alone. But then on top of it, they were battered last year. But look where they are. They still sit with very strong balance sheets. And you have a macro you know, overhang here of, of a yeah. hawkish Fed that is now shifting, regardless of the banking crisis. So now throw in SVB, you have some you know, de deflationary pr pressures. You have a Fed that is likely to think about pausing and, and sort of stopping on the rates. And who does that benefit? It benefits you know, tech companies, their, their cost to borrow becomes cheaper. But they can do the R&D. Sylvia, and then just to jump in on the Fed, do you think that they mm -hmm. won't be hiking, therefore, come next week? Oh, I think that the Fed will likely, you know, I, I don't know what the Fed will do, but I, in my opinion, I think, you know, 25 bips is likely to be on the table with a long explanation that is not as hawkish um, around the idea that they're going to pause and, and, you know, take in the environment and see what happens, because I think there's this massive need now to reinstall confidence in the banking system. And, and, and a shock like that and a scare like that that actually does have an impact on consumers and investors. It makes investors want to sit on the sideline, mm. makes consumers not want to spend because they're worried about that recession, you know, and so on. So I do think that beyond this next rate hike, it's going to be a much different story than it was a month ago. So when you're looking at allocating money, have you been this week and into what? I, you know, I, I have, not yesterday when the market was rallying, but I, you know, I look at the long term um, as an investor and the things that I like in the long term are that fourth industrial revolution trade, right? The, the quantum, the machine learning and the AI, I continue to allocate there. So when we have these pullbacks days like today's um, names, I, I like to look at a basket of stocks that represents those themes, whether it's semiconductors, the big tech companies. And, you know, in my mind, I'm going to hold those for the next three to five years and that'll pay off. 
And then I diversify too, right? I like defensive portfolios. I like alternative energy, things mm. like hydrogen, you know, the, the way of the, the future of how we'll sort of power our cars and homes and things like that. That's a growing trend. And all of these names are, are you know, battered along with the rest of the market this week. So in general, though, if you're an investor, you know, I think even index exposure is right. good to pick up mm. at these levels when you get pullbacks like today. When I think of defiance, of course, Ed, I think of the ETFs that are related to crypto and not just in the Nasdaq, yes. but boy, what a week for crypto. Well, I guess, Sylvia, my question would be that, that there is this high degree of bullishness around crypto or, or digital assets, right? Yet the world around that industry, the startups, the companies are under quite severe duress. How do you square that? Yeah, so you know, the um, going back to you know Caroline, I think we square it by creating a short fund. <laughs> so we're actually sort of you know worried about some of that risk, and we think that a lot of investors in the short term will be bearish. But you know, that being said, I think it depends on what type of crypto we're talking about. So if you look at Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin is almost like the S and P five hundred of 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 crypto, right? It's it's sort of it's the the least risky of of crypto assets, and I think that with the bank blow up. A lot of investors have, have viewed that as a good alternative um, to not have exposure, essentially, to, to both government and bank failures and things like that. So it's essentially catching a bid. But I think if you look at the overall crypto economy, it's the same situation as you have with you know, high, highly leveraged um, growth companies that are, you know, not the fangs necessarily, but they're highly impacted by rates. They're highly impacted by inflation. They're very volatile. And when you have, again, a bank collapse and you have an uncertain macro backdrop of recession or not, you, you're unlikely to have investors piling into those types of names, in, in my opinion. I think they'll stick with Bitcoin. You know, maybe they'll look at Ethereum. Um, but, but I think, you know, the smaller names are, are probably not going to catch a bid. Two names that I showed at the, the top of the show were NVIDIA and Microsoft. And artificial intelligence, despite all of the chaos in the banking sector, has continued to be a theme. At least that's what sell siders are writing about. How are you positioning to kind of take advantage of momentum in that space? Yeah, at, at our company, they're actually uh, two of the top holdings in our in our quantum basket, which is the machine learning and AI uh, trade there. And I think what we're looking for is is just the build out. You know, there, there's an expected CAGR of of about 37 percent in the next five years, strictly off of AI. If you think about how that's going to impact every sector from you know, retail, um, Amazon being able to target ads and, and, you know, kind of put things back into your basket more accurately, healthcare, connecting doctors, you know, robots, research, all of these types of things that we've, we've talked mm. about before, defense, you know, more precise targeting. All of this depends on AI. We know that that's growing out. And, you know, Microsoft just really um, put themselves in, in, in the front of the pack there in terms of R&D and investment in the space. Love a discussion of a compound annual growth rate. We love it, Sylvia Jablonski, <laughs> CEO and CIO of Defiance ETFs. We wish you a restful weekend. Yeah, I think we all need one. Caro, staying in the world of crypto, though, a clash involving disgruntled Coinbase customers will give the U.S. Supreme Court its first taste of the world of cryptocurrencies, foreshadowing future cases that could help define the industry. Next week, justices will hear arguments stemming from Coinbase's efforts to push two lawsuits into arbitration, so a procedural battle rather than a crypto specific matter. Coinbase wants court proceedings stopped when an appeal is filed seeking to compel arbitration. The joint case comes as high stakes fights involving the likes of Ripple and Grayscale work their way toward the court, shaping the rights of customers and companies alike in the fledgling industry. We're going to keep across that in the coming weeks. And as we go to break, I'm just looking at Bitcoin. Over a seven day basis, we're up 23 percent on track and actually in our best week since February of 2021. And that's what we were talking with Sylvia about, that kind of longer term bullishness despite short term bearish jitters. That's the picture of Bitcoin. This is Bloomberg. Let's say that the Fed hadn't stepped up today and Silicon Valley Bank failed and like a whole bunch of startups lost their venture dollars. That would have that would have been an an that would have been an event that I think would have been way worse than 01. Mm -hmm. Like that would have been catastrophic. 
That was longtime venture capitalist Bill Gurley with some of his thoughts on the banking crisis and its ramifications. It's been seven days since Silicon Valley banks collapsed, the biggest U.S. lender to fail in more than a decade. Many tech startups and venture capitalists, the same industries, by the way, that fueled SVB's rise, scrambled to pull their money out. And amid the exodus, tech companies diversified away from one single bank to a mix top-tier names, but also fintech startups that technically aren't banks at all. One of those, Mercury. And in the past week, the startup has onboarded thousands of new customers. Mercury's co-founder and CEO, Imad Akun, joins us now. You are not a bank. Yes. Your uh, banking services are provided by Choice Financial and Evolve Bank. Yep. So explain how you've been able to benefit this week from SVB situation. Yeah, so you, know, you can go to mercury.com and get a bank account. Uh, we work with two partner banks, Choice and Evolve, uh, but we provide a full kind of suite of banking services. You can get checking account, wires, uh, debit card, credit card, venture debt. Uh, we've been, you know, we launched about four years ago. We've been kind of successfully doing this. We have about 100,000 businesses that use Mercury. It is 9.17 local time on Friday, 12.17 in New York. At this moment, give me a dollar value for the business that you've brought in this week. Oh, it's been above $2 billion so far. And then that equates to deposits or...? Yes, and deposits. Okay, Caro. Imad, you've explained, of course, very succinctly there, your business and the partner banks that, in particular, you lend upon or, or use. I'm just interested as to now insurance. Everyone must be coming to you saying, am I FDIC insured? And when you go to the website, it shows that actually you can be insured up to $5 million in terms of deposits. Understand for our audience how this is protected in particular. Yeah, so yeah, we're not a bank, so we don't take these deposits and lend them out. We work with our partner banks, and they have a network of sweep banks underneath them. So in order to provide $5 million in FDIC insurance, uh, that's split between 20 banks. Uh, yeah. you know, what we heard, actually last week we had about a million dollars in FDIC insurance, so we've increased it by 5x, and that's obviously 20x bigger than what you would get at one bank. Yeah. Uh, you know, we heard people were really concerned about you know, what's happening and is, is their money safe at Mercury, and obviously I can say it's safe, but providing that extra insurance with uh, FDIC insurance on their deposits helps a lot. I think, Caro, the main point you and I have discussed all week, right, is that diversifying, A, was something no one had thought about early enough, but yeah. B, there were benefits to going to traditional banks and some startups that offer different things to the traditional banks. And, Iman, to that point, you are offering, actually, access to money market funds, but they're not your money market funds. It's Vanguard's, for example. You're offering, therefore, to split up people's deposits and spread them across, well, an, a, a range of other lenders. Why come to a middleman? Why come to a Mercury when you're worried about the security of all these lenders? Yeah, so Mercury is a software provider. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're buying a Vanguard fund, you can obviously go to Vanguard or you can uh, go to E-Trade or you can come to Mercury to do it. Uh, we just make it very simple. You know, these business owners have a lot on their mind. They just want to build their business. They don't want to be thinking about, where's my money? We can do things like uh, automatically set up rules so when you're uh, when you need more operational uh, uh, account money, it automatically sweeps between the Vanguard fund to your normal operational fund. Uh, so we make it very simple and easy. And Mercury is actually not in the money flow at all. We're not a custodian. We're not a bank. Uh, we are an enabler to uh, to these companies and and to the kind of financial institutions behind the scene. You're backed by CRV, Andreessen, Quatu. You raised at a 1.6 billion dollar valuation in 2021. Yep. You raising now? No, we're profitable. We ha we're making money every month. So we're Do people a, want to write you a check? How many uh, people are knocking on the door? I've, I've had lots of VCs reach out this week, but, you know, it's just been so busy. I'm like, this is, you know, this is not the right time to be to try to talk to me. <laughs> Imad, we thank you for coming on, for being so clear with us all and making time amid, well, the flood of interest. Imad Akund of Mercury, thank you. Coming up, well, we'll turn to artificial intelligence. That's as Baidu surges after brokerages tested and approved the company's just unveiled ChatGPT-like service. More next in Talking Tech. And sticking with artificial intelligence, we're watching Nvidia shares. Just upgraded to overweight from equal weight at Morgan Stanley. Analysts saying that the development of generational 
and AI. It's too much of a mega trend to get distracted by tactical concerns. Look at it, currently up 1% off at its highs of the day. From New York, from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg. On a market neutral basis, the, the quality factor is at a new high. So I, I, the market perceives these companies, uh, you know, the Apples and the Microsofts of the world as, as quality and safe havens. Uh, and that's kind of what kept the, the S&P afloat. Right? It's that push pull, the financials getting crushed, but then the tech's pulling it. Once the market starts thinking and feeling that, oh, even Apple's not safe, then, then the S&P could actually roll over. Kept the Nasdaq higher too. John Colovus there, head of technical strategy at Macro Risk Advisors. Now it's time for talking tech. Baidu surging more than 14% today after brokerages, including Citigroup, tested the company's just unveiled chatbot service and granted it that their preliminary approval. Look, Baidu's leap reversed that 6% loss on Thursday after the founder you see here, Robin Lee, debuted the new artificial intelligence technology via a recorded video. Speaking of AI, data analytics firm Presate II opened in Abu Dhabi G42, drew orders worth 25.8 billion for its 496 million initial share offering. In the latest sign of strong demand for Middle Eastern offerings. And Microsoft handed in formal antitrust commitments to the EU. Watchdogs, of course, they're probing the $69 billion plan to buy Activision Blizzard. This action now puts the onus on Britain's merger watchdog to deliver a potentially decisive ruling on the deal and pushes the EU's final deadline from March 16th to May 22nd. And the CEO of Amazon's Twitch game streaming platform is resigning. Emmett Shear will be replaced by Twitch president Dan Clancy. The departure marks the latest executive turnover over at Amazon's subsidiaries. Shear, who has been at Twitch since its very origins, said he's leaving to spend more time with his son, Ed. Caroline, coming up, Rippling has raised 500 million in emergency funds following the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. We are going to talk to the CEO Parker Comrade next. And look, the actions in the banks, right? We're still tracking what's happening amid halts and volatility. First Republic continues to drop on track, of course, for its biggest weekly decline ever and trading at a April 2011 low. You see other names, though, impacted. The KBW Bank Index also dropping. This is pretty widespread. We've got a lot to discuss in the next 30 minutes. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. It's 9.30 a.m. here on the West Coast, but 4.30 p.m. in London. European markets closing. This is the picture. The stocks Europe 600 down 1.3%, passing over economic data and also jitters, of course, in the banking sector. Euro continuing to strengthen against the dollar. 106.7 on euro dollar up around six tenths of one percent. We've seen some fluctuations in the currency market over the course of the week because, of course, central bank policy being a key factor. ECB giving us that half point hike, but not a lot of guidance for what's to come in the months and years ahead. And it you know, the bond markets, we're seeing some, some kind of advancement continue. German 10-year burned off by 16 basis points, 2.12%. The UK two-year yield at the short end, we're at 3.2%, down 16 basis points as well. Inflation, a big focus right now when it comes to the United Kingdom. Change the boards and let's look over the course of the week because the stock 600 Europe in the equity space having its worst week since September, really feeling the impacts of that banking situation. Compare that with the, Euro, uh, the picture here in the United States, Caroline, and the Nasdaq 100. Yeah, certainly the ripple effects far and wide. Let's talk about how difficult the banking crisis has made it to raise capital for tech startups. Here's what Clio Capital's co-founder, Sarah Kunst, had to say about it earlier this week. It's going to be a hard quarter to pitch in, you know, getting net new capital out of VCs who don't already have an obligation, you know, to the money they've put with you is going to be harder than ever. And it doesn't mean it's totally dried up and there will be tons of people starting great new companies. But this is going to be a much different fundraising environment than even a few months ago. But for some, the funding is still open. 
Let's bring in Parker Conrad for his take on all of this. CEO of payroll service provider Rippling has just raised $500 million in three days alone. Parker, this is all in many ways because of what occurred with Silicon Valley Bank. Can you talk us through the money that you've managed to raise and why? Yes. Um, Rippling um, is, among other things, a payroll company. We make software for businesses to manage everything related to employees, so payroll, HR, IT, finance, expense reimbursements. And we think we can cut a lot of the administrative work involved in running those things out by doing it all in one place. And the way payroll works is companies send us money a few days ahead of payday, and then we send it along to their employees. And so when Silicon Valley Bank failed, they were previously the rails for our payroll service. Um, we had to move in just a few hours over to J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, but we also, um, we knew on Friday when the bank failed, there were 50,000 people that we needed to make sure got paid, whose companies had already sent us money. And so what we did is we actually took about $130 million of our own capital and sent it out the door to make sure that everybody got their paycheck on Friday um, and moved heaven right. and earth to do that. My uh, colleague, Katie Roof, has just texted me. She's been writing about your situation this morning. <clears throat> Given now that the SVB situation is kind of more resolved, what are you going to do with that $500 million? Yeah. So we raised the money to make sure that we'd be able, even if the, the FDIC did nothing, that we'd be able to backstop our client funds. Um, but as it turns out, um, you know, depositors were protected. So we, we now, Rippling is incredibly well capitalized. We have, you know, almost a billion dollars on our balance sheet. What would you have done if the deposits <clears throat> were not insured? We, we wanted to make sure that any company that had sent us money, we were going to get their employees paid. Um, and so that was why we wanted to make sure we had this as a backup plan to a backup plan to a backup plan. Caro, this is an amazing conversation because it's a snapshot of what happened in the moment. We're mm. hearing so many founders sort of pretty dire about the long-term impacts of SVB and being able to raise funds, and yet you have a company here that did it in three days. And also, you luckily already had a banking provider other than SVB, which is JP Morgan, but we went to our own audience and said, how hard is it as a founder, as a fund even, mm. to diversify your banks? It's pretty hard, it's complicated, said 44%. To that point, Parker, was, was it complicated for you to rev up the JP Morgan and also are you now more diversified even than that? It was, I mean, look, we have a, a number of different banking relationships, many different bank accounts across the world. Um, but we always assumed that um, you know, if something happened with SVP, which was the main role, uh, rails for our payroll service, we'd have about two weeks to get something up and running. And then what happened is when the bank failed, we only had about three and a half hours. And so we put a team of 15 of the best engineers in the company on getting this up and running in that time frame, time frame. and then a much larger team over mm -hmm. the weekend and the days to come, really just making sure that everything was solid, everything was well grooved, and sort of compressed that timeline to make sure that nothing was interrupted for our clients. What's also so fascinating about your story, Parker, is the support of your venture capital supporters, and in particular, the round that was led by Green Oaks, Neil Mehta. How important was it to have VCs on hand that would just rally the troops and give you money when you needed it? We're, you know, we're incredibly fortunate that there are a bunch of investors that have been really supportive of Rippling, um, that we've known for a long time, and that have, you know, even, you know, even as the funding environment for late stage startups has gotten shaky, have always really wanted to find ways to own more of Rippling. And so we were able to put together on very short notice around, you know, at a, at a really fair price, um, uh, you know, at an $11.25 billion valuation to get a bunch more capital in the business. And that's going to allow us sort of no matter what happens here to focus on building the right products for our customers um, and, and growing our company. You kind of scrambled to take money from your balance sheet to help with payroll for others. Have you been made whole again after what's happened? And, and just reflecting on your customer base, is there still problems out there? Are there still problems out there for people trying to make payroll to move money around? We, on Monday morning when SVB reopened, we got all of the customer funds out of SVB. And so we've been made completely whole for all of this. And there are problems still in the ecosystem? Uh, not for us. I mean, our, our systems are as solid as ever, just with a different bank, with J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, more broadly to the economy um, as a result of some of the shakiness in the banking sector, but we feel very good about, about sort of our service. We're billing this $500 million as an emergency fundraise, and I just wanted to ask, 
how you felt about the terms of that raise. Were you happy? Was it a yeah. compromise? I, you know, I really disagree with the characteriz characterization of it as an emergency. Um, I think it came together very quickly. Um, but look, this was great capital on attractive terms. I mean, there aren't a lot of late stage startups that can raise that amount of capital in a very short period of time at, at these valuations. Um, I thought it was a, a great deal for the company and I, I feel really good about it. Hmm. I had Lion currently says emergency funds will quickly maybe update that to new funds, Parker. Ultimately, what now? Do you expand? Do you use the 500 million to grow? Or do you, <clears throat> can you in some way sort of give it back? Um, we're we're going to focus, we, we're going to use this money to sort of continue to invest in our product, in research and development. Uh, Rippling has a really unusual commitment to R&D among SaaS tech companies. We spend an enormous amount in comparison to our revenue on developing new products, building new software. And we think it's what makes us uh, have the best product on the market. Parker, you're a fintech. You understand financial plumbing better than most. Do you think at this moment, the single point of failure that you had avoided by having other banks, does it make you worry about a centralized financial system as it stands? I mean, look, we, we have different banking relationships with a number of, of different banks, and we, we continue to sort of um, diversify um, sort of the, the rails that we have within the banking sector. Um, I think in this case, things worked out pretty well. Um, we found out 9 a.m. on Friday, on the day that employees were supposed to get paid, um, that SVB was shut down and all of the funds that were supposed to arrive for payday on Friday were locked up. And we had three and a half hours to get things up and running with JP Morgan. Um, and we were able to do that in three and a half hours and get people paid using our own capital. So I look at it as sort of a real, a real success story about our ability to make sure that you know, 50,000 ordinary Americans that were paid through Rippling got paid last Friday. Rippling CEO Parker Comrade, thank you for sharing that story with Caroline and I. Now, coming up, we're going to be joined by Vinod Kosla to talk all things VC after what was, let's be honest, Caroline, a crazy week in the world of banking, but also critically for technology. But look at the big tech benchmarks and maybe you'd be OK at thinking it wasn't as crazy as many felt. Four and a half percent higher on the Nasdaq over the last five days. Big tech still proving attractive. This is Bloomberg. Time for our global VC roundup. P.T. Thiel has $50 million or had $50 million of his own money in Silicon Valley Bank when it went under. The Financial Times reports Thiel says he did not draw down from his own account because he believed the bank would not fail, even though his founders fund had warned its portfolio companies to move money away from the tech focused lender. Malaysia's Petronas plans to expand its corporate VC arm by up to 200 million as early as April, according to Reuters, citing sources. The branch will focus on making innovation and technology investments across Asia Pacific, but the plan still being finalized. And finally, Walmart is investing another $200 million in Indian payments arm PhonePay. The investment was done at a pre-money valuation of $12 billion and is part of an ongoing financing effort to raise a total of up to $1 billion for the startup, Caroline. And let's dig into the flow of money at the moment, particularly, Ed, around the impact of the current banking crisis we're still all consumed in, how it's unfolded, who it's tainted, who it's managed to highlight their strength. The VC world, of course, is one that we're going to focus on, with Silicon Valley Bank and others within the realm still being a concern. We've got a perfect voice, Vinod Kozler, founder of Kozler Ventures, with us. And I say we are not quite out the woods yet, because First Republic Bank still struggling, still needing support from other banks in the system. Are we through the woods or do you think there's still more areas of concern, Vinod? SVB for sure is completely safe today. Uh, it is insured by the FDIC. So in fact, it's the best place to money uh, put money because it's yielding more 
better interest rates than Treasury, and it's very, very safe, mm. or just as safe. In many ways, you, over the course of the crisis weekend, wanted to make it safe for your own portfolio companies. Look at a tweet you were tweeting out on March 12th, talking about how you, you were not using LP money, and you're trying to help your companies, basically using through loans, basically depending on your own personal wealth, Benoit, it's been reported. What made you decide to do this? Well, our companies needed help. We didn't want to and couldn't use LP money unless we were in, ensuring great terms for our LPs. So we decided to use personal funds and at zero, uh, at the, uh, zero profit for us, uh, provide loans to our companies directly from our personal lenders to the companies. Vinod, I understand next week you'll be one of many traveling to Washington, D.C. for a summit of sorts. What is it that you'll be discussing with your industry peers and others? Well, next week's dinner that has been reported in various publications is about the influence of China in our technology race and economic war with China. Uh, so that's the topic of discussion. Hey, Vinod, the last week for some has been unthinkably hard. For others, you know, they moved quickly. My question is, has this derailed all of the things that your firm and the venture community were working on? Or do, does business now carry on as normal, the writing of checks, the focus on AI? I believe in a few months, three to six months, business will be back to normal. Uh, we, of course, encouraged our founders to leave everything but three months of money yeah, in Silicon Valley Bank, have three months worth of cash outside. So we didn't want to cause a bank run. Unfortunately, all our peers didn't do the same. So we saw the phenomena that we saw. At this point, FDIC money is safe. We're encouraging our founders to put money back in S SPB. Um, so we are in pretty good shape now. I think the interest in AI is driven by fundamentals, not by hype, I believe, though there is plenty of hype too. Uh, I'm pretty excited about where AI and some other technologies can lead us. Caroline, I think the, the key unanswered question, and it may take time, is who's accountable for what happened, right? Mm. We're still asking how this happened, but who let it happen? And, Vino, do you have a perspective on that? Because some look to the VC community itself and say it kind of added fuel to the fire. Well, uh, the VC community added fuel to the fire by, by being a little irresponsible at the last minute. I believe what SPV was doing was running a hedge fund based on interest rates inside a bank. And that was where the fault lies, I believe, uh, to the best of the information I have. And that is sub should be subject to regulation. Meanwhile, of course, the VC community comes together once again, as you just articulated, a dinner in Washington, thinking about relationships between the US and China. We think of the TikTok CEO, of course, going in front of Congress next week. Mm -hmm. What is the status? between China and the U.S. in terms of technology at the moment? Well, the dinner was set up long before either the current events or TikTok events. It's not really related to TikTok. It's related to the larger technological race we have for global technology uh, power and hence economic power globally. And I think many of us feel the U.S. and the Western world should in general uh, invest in technology and continue to be uh, part of that winning strategy, I hope. Uh, you know, tech, venture capital has been a big part of GDP growth in the U.S. It's been a big part of innovation, and I hope it continues to be. And it's critically important for the Western world that that happens. Vino, TikTok and AI are two fields that seem to be increasingly at the center of the relationship between the United States and China. Let's start with TikTok. Bloomberg's reported that US officials are essentially saying to ByteDance, sell your interests in TikTok or it will be banned from the United States. As a long time name in the world of technology in this country, what do you make of that? 
Well, they've taken the position they have. I think in general, TikTok has been used for spying on U.S. citizens. So uh, if that's true, and I don't have as much in information as the administration does, then we clearly should penalize that kind of behavior. As to the AI battle, it's a much more critical battle than the TikTok battle and a general race for technological superiority in AI, and hence all the areas it affects, which in 20, yes. 25 years will be almost all of the economy. Vinod, Caroline and I have been talking a lot about artificial intelligence for weeks and months, and we joke that at the beginning of this week, the air went out of the room for AI. But actually, it started to creep back in in recent days. You, is that an area you're still focused on? And will you be writing checks for AI-related startups? Absolutely. Remember, we invested in AI, in OpenAI, five years ago. We were the first venture investor in OpenAI. And the trend is long-term and consistent. And I've been writing about it for the last 10 years. AI, its implications for the economy, its implications for cyber war, for war, uh, both defense and non-defense uses. Uh, it's a very important technology. I think uh, small time perturbations like we saw, and it was a significant but still uh, temporal, temporary perturbation will not affect the trend in AI and our investing interest in AI. But now, does winner take all, open AI, GPT-4, really seemed to impress. Baidu didn't initially, and now it seems to be mm. getting some applaud with its chat GPT-like Ernie. Can there be space for many really additive startups in this space? I do believe there'll be multiple platforms. Google has a very good play. Microsoft has embraced OpenAI. Uh, Baidu will, of course, uh, with backing from the Chinese governments, uh, try and win. I do think there's room for more than one uh, platform. Uh, I do think number of applications on top of these platforms will be very, very large and very, very robust area for investment. Vino Kozla, fascinating to talk to you through the ramifications of this last week from a banking perspective, from an investing perspective, from an AI perspective, founder of Kozla Ventures. We thank you. Stay well. Coming up, of course, uh, it's been going viral. We're not going to talk about banking. The March Madness, the brackets, they're going nuts after yesterday's upset. We're going to talk something that maybe perhaps we're less proficient on than Tech Head and it's basketball. Yeah, if you're not watching basketball, maybe you're watching Disney. Shares down 1%, but there was a third-party report from Antenna this morning that their ad-supported tier is getting a lot more traction than the likes of Netflix and Warner Brothers' ad-supported offerings. Not doing much to support the stock, down 1%, but I guess outperforming some of its peers, which are also lower. Interesting stock to track because those ad supported tiers are pretty new. This is Bloomberg. Look, aside from bank collapses, it's what everyone else has been talking about. The March Madness bracket. The madness that was, of course, for many, all the planning, the preparation going into brackets, been blown out of the water. Number 15 seed, Princeton's shock victory against the number two seeded Arizona. Now, we at Bloomberg, we like numbers, we like estimates, and we ask some of the wealthiest on Wall Street and CEOs of technology companies to join this year's Bloomberg Brackets for a Cause fundraiser. The entrants donate 20,000, and they select a charity that receives the funds if they're in the top three finisher in the men's and women's brackets. The results, nearly 40% of the roughly 50 participants seem to be choosing Alabama to win the men's NCAA basketball tournament, and Alabama, which will play against Auburn on Saturday. Ed, when you have heard, she came second last year. Yeah, look, I married into a Bruins household and I don't really have a strong opinion on it either way, but I know our terminal audience does and the world is watching on social. It is all about university basketball, folks. Meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Follow us on Twitter, top of the hour. We're going to have a Twitter spaces, Ed. Big conversation coming up on the week. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.